I want us to spend some time in our sermon talking about 10 great things. But I want to spend time talking about 10 great things that are about the church. You and I both know that we could spend a lot of time talking about 10 things. And it was kind of hard to find 10 things, just 10, that were great about the church. We could spend this morning talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, and we could keep going. And we could continue to find great things about the church but you and I know that the church is great and here's one of the things that's great about it it's not great because of you and me now we have to be present to make the church possible the church is made up of the people the collective people but we're not the reason that the church is great and I want us to spend time this morning talking about 10 different things that show us why the church is the greatest thing upon the earth and here's the first one Christ is the head of the church. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's notice verses 22 through 23. As we go through these 10 things, there's going to be one passage on every item. And we're going to go to that passage, and we're going to read it. And we're going to see what God's Word says about His body, the church, and why that makes it the best thing that exists upon His creation. The first reason is, Christ is is the head of the church. And isn't it great to know that some man is not sitting upon a throne on the earth as the head of the church? You and I both know we make mistakes. We in past and maybe in the future will sin. But the church has as its head, as its leader, as its ruler, Christ. The one in which was sinless, Ephesians 1, and 23 says this, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is great because, number one, Christ serves as its head. We don't have to worry about who serves as the head of the church. We do not have to worry about who is in control of all things because it's not man. It is not man that is standing upon the earth or ruling here that leads the church in the direction it would go. It was God by divine plan in which made it possible for Jesus Christ to be upon the earth or him to sacrifice himself so you and I So all of those before us and all of those that are after us that are willing to be obedient to him can serve under his headship and be provided in the midst of his salvation. So the first reason the church is great, Christ is its head. Here's number two. It is the body. It is the body. Go into Colossians chapter 1 and notice verse 18. The greatest thing or one of the greatest things about the church is it is the body. We do not have to worry about the religious world that exists in our lifetime because we understand something about that religious world. There are multiple bodies of people who say they are Christians going about. Now, I don't say that to be mean or to be rude, but we understand something when we look at passages like Colossians 1.18. We find this, and he is the head, talking about Christ, the church, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I want you to notice something about the language in this passage. It is singular. It is singular. There is one church that was established by our Savior. There is one church in which was purchased by the blood of Christ. And that is the church that is the church that belongs to him. One of the greatest blessings we have to know is the church is the body. And here's why I say that. Number one, it's under his headship, as we've noted. 
Number two, it is considered his body. But number three, you and I, we, we get to be a part of this body. And we get to fulfill various roles that, that exist in the midst of this body. And we get to fulfill various things that the body needs to do. But the greatest thing about the church is it is the body that belongs to Christ and it's under his headship. So Christ is its head. It is the body. But notice with me, it has many members. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and notice verse 12. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, some things are being discussed about the church. And in the entire book of 1 Corinthians, a lot of things are happening about the body. He's talking about the church. So that tells us something as we begin to read 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. He is talking, he is pinning these words about you and me. So when we read chapter 12, verse 12, we understand something. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also in Christ. One of the greatest things about the church is there's not just one of us. There is not just one of us. I, I'm kind of privileged this morning, not just because I get to stand here, but because the way you're directing, you're only seeing one person and maybe the heads of other people. But I get to sit out and look at your faces. And as I look at you this morning, I see individual people. I see people of different ages. I see people of different backgrounds. I see people that come from different educational areas. I see people that work in different areas in our world. And what I see is a bunch of different people. Now you may be wondering, how is that a blessing and how is it good that it's made of many members? Here's a few things. Number one, the church is made or has many members because all in which that exists upon this earth are blessed to be able to have the opportunity to be a part of this body, the church. See, the church is not made of many individuals that are all the same. Imagine what the assembly would look like if we were all the same. Imagine if we had a million yous or a million me's, and that's all that existed in the midst of the body. You see, as we looked at the previous passage in Colossians 1.18, as we look in here at 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12, it has many members. And here's the third thing about this. We all have different things that we can do. We all have different things that we can do. Some of you are good at things that I could never comprehend of being able to understand or being able to do. And that is one of the greatest blessings about the church. We all are trying to come together to worship the Lord, but in the midst of what we do, we all have different things and different abilities. And the church is made up of different people who can express different things. So one of the greatest things about the church is it has many members. I think our next point is one of my favorite. It wears the name of Christ. Now go with me to Romans 16, 16, and most likely this is a familiar passage to many of you, but one of the greatest things about the church is it does not bear my name. And the church does not bear your name. You see, we understand that we are a part of the church. When we're made a part of the church, when we're added to the church, we're added to the body of Christ, the body in which Christ purchased. We're wanting to be a part of the church. Now read with me Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, some people read that and, and they just don't like the way it reads. But let's notice what it's saying. Salute one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another. Enjoy being in the midst of each other's company. Walk up and give that man a handshake. Walk up and shake her hand. You see, the greeting with the holy kiss was the handshake of the day. You see, in other foreign countries that exist, that still goes on as the way of greeting each other, a, a, a way of endearment, a term of respect. But you know how we do it in, in, the, in this country. When we see someone that we know and we respect, what do we do? We walk up to them and we stick out that hand. And we usually wait until they've put their hand in ours. And we give that a firm grip and we start talking. 
You see, we're supposed to greet one another. But here's the beautiful part about the passage. The churches that belong to Christ, that's the idea. We are a part of a church in which wears the name of Christ. And isn't that great? You don't have to say, I belong to Jonathan Burns' church. And I want you to know, that is a very good thing. Because I cannot provide you blood in which will save your soul. Not from this physical body, I cannot. But one of the greatest things about the church that exists is, it's talked about in this book. And we find in the pages of this book that those in which belong to Christ are going to be a part of his body. And those are going to be the bodies in which wear his name. So we wear the name of Christ. We also understand something else from Ephesians 5.25. Christ loves the body. Go with me to Ephesians 5 verse 25. In that chapter, there's a contrast happening about the marriage relationships and husbands and wives and how they're to be submitted unto each other. How there is a role in a system, a hierarchy, you could say, established for the home. And we see the respect in which God has for the home. But in the midst of this passage, we see how God has a respect for his body. God has a respect for his body. And here's how we find it in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, one of the greatest things that exist and one of the most beautiful blessings that exist is that Christ gave his physical life so that you and I could have life. The cross is one of the greatest depictions of love that ever exists. And as long as time goes on, the cross will always stand as a picture of love. You know, we often think about how families love their children. And as I see Charlie on his way out, I think and am flooded with memories of him. E even at six months old, I, I know who he is. And many of you as parents, you know, and as husbands and wives, you know what you would do for your spouses. And you know what you would give for them. And you know what you would do. But you see, we limit ourselves, don't we? Christ was able to give himself for the world and that proves unto us that he loved it i love how it reads it even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it if we ever want to see the depiction of love it was the giving of oneself for the many it was the giving of oneself for the many. And that's the depiction in which we see here of Christ. He gave himself for us. So Christ loves the church. Also, its members, the members that belong to the church, well, they're Christians. They're Christians. Go with me to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Acts 11, verse 26. You may be saying, well, doesn't that make sense? Well, I hope it does. I hope if we expect ourselves to be members of the body of Christ that we will call ourselves Christians. Read with me what we find written in Acts eleven twenty six, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I want you to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even the book of Acts. And I want you to see the depictions of how in the midst of people who were being taught, we see this phrase, and they made disciples. They made fellow people who were willing to do the same things they were being taught. And this is the crucial message of a disciple. He follows Christ. We've already established that the greatest thing that exists as we began was Christ was the head of the church. The ultimate definition, as we discussed in Bible class, the depiction of a Christian, a Christ-like individual. Would we give our lives up for each other? Would we sacrifice all that we had for each other? Would we give every fiber of our being in our time, in our finances, and in our mental abilities to help one another? Would we give those things up? If we're going to be Christians and going to be Christ-like people, 
I'm going to look around this room this morning. You're going to look around this room this morning, and you're going to say, I love these people. And what you're saying there is, I want to help these people. But you and I understand life is messy sometimes. Life is just messy sometimes. And that means sometimes when I'm helping people, guess what? We're going to have to get outside of our comfort zone. We're going to have to take the proverbial horse blinders off and be able to actually see what's happening around us. So much goes on. And as we being Christians, Christ-like people, I'm going to be willing to discipline myself to do whatever it takes to help my fellow Christian. But not only that, number two, I'm going to be willing to discipline myself to help make other Christians. One of the greatest characteristics is being found here of those in which were Christians. Oh, read the verse again. And when, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they were assembled themselves together with the church, and they taught much people. I'm going to spend my time teaching. Now you can teach in many different ways. You, you can teach in our classes that are behind us or in front of you as we're thinking about the physical plan of this building. You can teach your neighbors, whether it be the neighbors in which surpass the land beside you, or it can be your neighbors which live across town, or it can be your neighbors in which live in another country. You can teach them. If you're a child of God this morning, here's the greatest blessing that we know as being a Christian. You know what you did to become a Christian. Now that doesn't mean that you have to know the depths and the riches of the book of Revelation and know what all of the prophetic prophecy is in that book. But you know what it means to be a Christian, don't you? You know what a Christian's supposed to be doing. And here's the best thing. You know what one has to do to become a Christian. We are members as Christians. And we'll act that way in all that we do. So its members are Christians. Uh, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, 4. One of the greatest blessings that exists in the midst of the church is there is only one. There is only one. We find in Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. I, I don't have to worry this morning. You don't have to worry this morning. No one has to worry this morning which church they need to belong to. Now you and I know as you drove in this morning, you probably passed a, a handful of church buildings as our society would call them. Buildings in which people meet for religious purposes. And you may have passed other churches in which you know to be faithful. But you know just as much as I do, you passed some places that we're not doing as this book describes. And that's the beautiful thing of Ephesians 4.4. 4. There's one body. There's one body. And if we let the church be in the simplicity of how it was designed, I won't have to worry about which building I walk into. I'll know there's only one body. And I know the people that are going to be in this building that are a part of the one body are going to be doing the same things that you and I do. But we also have to understand that in the world in which we live, that's not how simple it is, is it? That means the Christian, as being thinking of the idea of there's only one church, the Christian has to be diligent. When we take our families on vacation and we're searching out somewhere to worship, you have to be diligent. You have to see where you're going. And sometimes, no matter what research you put into deciding where you're going to go, you may find yourself in a place in which you do not belong. The question is, what would the Christian do about that? And what are we going to be doing? There's only one body. Are you a part of that body? Are you a part of the body that Christ died for? There's only one. You need to investigate your life and see where you stand in the midst of the one body. You know, there's something great about this one body that's found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Christ established it. Christ established it. We find there upon Jesus talking to Peter, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus established the church. That was a part of the mission in which he came. Remember Luke 19, 10, to seek and to save that which was lost. The church being a place for those that are lost to come and to change their lives. Christ established it. You know, when you look upon this building, you, you do not see somewhere on this building that says, so and so that lived here established this church. 
You can go to various corporations that exist. I know you can do this at Kroger. You can see this, I believe, at JCPenney and even some of the older goodies stores. But you'll see upon their signs, established 1801, established 1905. Well, there's something beautiful about this church, about the church in which is being presented in the New Testament. It was established by the only perfect and pure person that has ever lived. And that's a fact we can take home. That's a fact, as we usually say, we can take that to the bank. It's a secure fact. Christ established the church. One of my favorite things about the church is the saved, they're added to the church. You know, we don't have to go through a voting process. We don't have to go through a membership referral process. We don't have to go through some extravagant means of donations. Here's what the Christian needs to do. The Christian needs to give his life to Christ, or the individual needs to give his life to Christ and submit to Christ as the head of the church and do whatever is necessary in one's life to make their life right with God. Look at Acts 2.47. These people were praising God and having favor with all the people. Now notice this is one of my favorite areas of Scripture. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I think we pass this verse up so often and we forget what's happening here. But those that were willing to become a child of God, those that were willing to be a disciple of Christ, those that were willing to do what Christ would have them to do, the Lord himself, he added them to the church. You don't have to come ask me to be a member of the church. But you need to do what the Lord says. And that's one of the greatest things that exist about the church. I don't have to go to you and say, hey, can I be a member of the church? But I need to do what the Lord would have me to do. As we prepare to conclude this morning, I want us to go right where we began this morning. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as Chris read for us just so well just a moment ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 is our emphasis but there's something great as I look out across this room this morning. The church as we know it. The church in which Christ established. The church in which he is the head of. The church in which is the body. The church in which has many members. The church in which wears his head. The church in which Christ loves. The church in which its members are Christians. The church in which is only made of one. The church in which Christ is established. The church in which the Lord adds the members to, it will be presented to God. Go with me, 1 Corinthians 15, and I just want us to notice as we did in our introduction this, or in our scripture reading this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But in every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, or the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. What's the idea being presented here? The idea is being shown unto you and me that at some point in time, at some point in time, which is called in this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end. When this earth is no more, when the judgment day exists, you and I, if we're faithful members of the Lord's body, we will be presented to the Heavenly Father. We will be presented the, to the God of Heavens. And here is the greatest thing about that. We know, if we are faithful children of God, that that presentation will be magnificent. And that that will usher in the beginning of eternity. Ten great things about the church. I know we had to go fast this morning and we went a little longer than I expected. But there are so many things that are great about the church. And here's one of the greatest. In the midst of the body of the Christ, in the midst of the worship assembly, there's always an opportunity to come unto the Lord. And we hit one of what I believe to be right now, one of the most crucial points of a worship assembly. 
You and I both know the world's a messy place. It's a dangerous place, and sometimes it's a sinful place. And sometimes you and I get wrapped up in this. It may be the case this morning that you are a child of God, and you're realizing right now, I've let sin come into my life. You know what the greatest part about a worship assembly is? We can pray together with you. We can pray with you and for you and help you in any way that you need to live the life that God would have you to live. You can make that right with the Lord, and that's the best part about a worship assembly. You can make your life right with Christ. Maybe the case this morning that you're not a child of God, and you're realizing there are many reasons I need to be a child of God. I hope these ten things encourage you to know the church that exists here fits the biblical pattern. The church that exists here wants not to be right because men see them as right, but wants to be right in the eyes of God. And that's important. If you're willing to make your life a part of Christ's life, if you're willing to become his child of God, we'd love to spend time with you. You may already know everything you need to do, and you may already be doing some of those things, but if you've not done them all, you've not become a Christian. And the best thing we'd love to see this morning is according to Acts 2.47, we'd love to see this morning the Lord add you to his church. It's not ours. It's not yours. It's his. If you have a need to respond to the invitation this morning, why don't you do so as together we stand and sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a grace. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day, what a day.